Hey, what up all my tooth doctors and doctresses? Welcome to another video at the Tooth Factory. Today we're going to continue with the CVS number 3 with Anti-Rhythmetics created by Dr. Kanan Shah and presented by me, Rishi Shah. So as we know, arrhythmia is an irregular heartbeat, heart rate, which may be irregular in pattern. So we'll, we'll discuss on how they work and how to treat them. This picture here directly shows us how the SA node tends to create an electric impulse and the AV node tends to forward it to the ventricles using the bundle of His over here and the Purkinje fibers here and here. This diagram on this side detects how the current travels. So SA node, AV node, ideally it's supposed to follow this green line down here and down to the ventricles. However, in an odd occasion, there's a local re-entry, and that leads to arrhythmia. Whenever there's a re-entry of an impulse back into the aorta from the ventricle or AV node, that's when there's arrhythmia. So again, that was just a brief introduction to what arrhythmia is, but we'll take a look at it in deeper. So we'll say arrhythmia overview today, etiology, automaticity versus impulse conduction, inotropic versus chronotropic, classification of arithmetics, anti-arithmetics, uh, mechanism of actions, therapeutic indications of anti-arithmetics, then we'll discuss in detail class 1 A and B, class 2, 3, and 4, and ending with references. Just to kind of get us kick-started today, just a little joke for you guys, uh, V-fib is usually smacked right by defibrillator as a treatment modality and remember when the movie said v-fib and they said crash card the patient's going into v-fib well that's actually one of the worst types of arrhythmias so let's dive into it without much ado arrhythmia introduction we know that skeletal muscles they contract upon a presence of a stimulus right for example a a hormonal change a impact by an electrical shock or so on but cardiac muscles are independent of that. They contract even in the absence of a stimulus. So they can self-monitor, and that's why they're known as automaticity. And that, in other words, is actually contraction. So whenever we hear this word, it's contraction of the heart that leads to intrinsic generation of a rhythmic action potential on its own. And it's commonly known as pacemaker cells that take care of this. Remember, pacemaker is a device, an external device, battery operated, that is placed in the heart to treat arrhythmias. This function in this automaticity will lead to abnormal contraction and conduction. So there's two words here, and very, very important to understand the differences. Contraction and conduction of the impulse in the myocardium is disturbed. This is arrhythmias. It can be divided anatomically, which means where this abnormality or dysfunction takes place is what decides what type of arrhythmia it will be. So this is atrial, sorry about the spelling mistake, atrial, AV node, and ventricular. These are the anatomic divisions of arrhythmias, further divided through ECG readings themselves, for example, QT prolongation. Right, that's one way of calling it. Then comes to understand pharmacology, we need to understand what is the process of impulse contraction and conduction first. So let's dive into that. See, cardiac impulse is generated by flow of ions. Fair enough. Ions such as sodium, potassium, calcium into and out of the heart muscle cells. Very, very simple. So the fact that the SA node is able to present the heart with an electrical current is because of these ions. And there are five phases of an action potential, zero to four, that create this current. Any delay or shortening of these phases will lead to a conduction delay. In other words, electrophysiological change. That's what it technically means. Therefore, if arrhythmias is caused by ionic malfunctions, then the antiarrhythmic drugs will act on the same ion channels. Fair enough to say? Perfect. So now that we've introduced arrhythmia, 
let's talk about the actual formation of the current. See, phase zero, and pay attention to this little diagram here, the chart here, and the pictures that are in here. Okay, so if phase zero, that's this one here. What is phase zero? It's sodium channels that open up and sodium moves inside the cell. So if you notice here, that when sodium moves into the cell, starting here, phase zero, all of a sudden there's a spike in the graph. And what kind of a spike is this? It's from negative millivolts all the way to positive millivolts, which means sodium has a plus sign. It increases the intracellular charge very quickly. And that is what propagates the signal. Okay, so this is the beginning of the signal. Phase one, so this is, sorry, phase zero where sodium moves into the cell. Okay, now phase one is initial rapid repolarization. In other words, polarization is negative charge and repolarization is to bring down this little spike that's the only job sodium channels are closed and potassium channels open and close back and forth therefore sodium potassium move outside and negative charge is created inside so this is just to compensate for this extensive spike over here to kind of bring it back down to normal, the zero charge level. Okay, so that's phase one, partial repolarization, where potassium will compensate for the excessive positivity of sodium, and sodium channels will close as potassium moves outside. Okay, moving on to phase two. It's the plateau stage, it's when it all just relaxes, right? It has nothing to do with sodium right now. Now it has to do with calcium channels. They open up, a slow calcium flow moves inside the cell, a slow potassium leaks outside the cell, which means there is no change in the charge. But what's important is that phase two has to do with calcium ions moving in. And remember from our previous lectures that calcium ions cause propagation of the impulse. And just to maintain the challenge, uh, we have potassium moving out. Moving on to phase three, which is repolarization, where calcium channels will close, potassium channels open, and potassium moves out, causing a negative charge inside the cell once again. Hence, repolarization, which is seen here, where calcium is prevented from going into the cell, and potassium moves outside the cell. Therefore, the negative charge builds inside the cell, right? So, we, so far we have the phase zero, phase one bringing it down, phase two plateau, not much activity. And all of a sudden we have a decrease in charge because repolarization occurs. But at one point, there is a slow sodium movement inside that increases depolarization and propagates the signal. This is phase four. So to compensate for that, a slow movement of sodium comes into play. And this is technically phase four, because then it goes back into a cycle, right? This is how cardiac muscles create action potential. So etiology of arrhythmias. Either the impulse has been an issue in its contraction and generation itself, or there is in malfunctioning impulse conduction. So remember the two words that we kept talking about. Contraction and conduction. It could be done through various parts of the heart. What's the difference between inotropic and chronotropic? Well, inotropic is the actual contraction effect, the strength of the heartbeat. Responsible molecule is SA node. Okay, SA node is in question here. Chronotropic is the conduction effect, it's the flow of the heart rate and atrial tissue, ventricular tissue, Purkinje fibers, these are all what's in question for chronotropic movement. And again, this chart we've just talked about earlier, it's in representation with the ECNG, electrocardiogram readings. So think of it this way, sodium moves in, positive charge, Potassium tends to kind of compensate for excessive. Potassium moves out, leading to a plateau stage where calcium moves in, 
and calcium causes propagation of this impulse as well and then repolarization happens with potassium moving out causing a negative charge built inside the cell and eventually phase 4 comes back where sodium starts to move in but why is all of this important it's important because it's easy to understand where what drugs will act for example in this case we have sodium channel blockers in this we have potassium channel blockers here is calcium channel blockers this is potassium channel blockers so what do we understand we said we have sodium channel blockers we have calcium channel blockers we have potassium channel blockers these are three groups of drugs for antiosmates how easy was that okay so here's a diagram that explains very very easily what type of arrhythmia can occur so if there is early after depolarization that will lead to arrhythmia for example this started in sodium moving in phase 0 phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 and this was supposed to be a propagation of phase 4 right here right phase 4 after it has moved down but what happened this entire segment disappeared and all of a sudden it started going depolarize repolarize depolarize repolarize so this is known as after depolarization early right now delayed after repolarization which means phase 0 phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 phase 4 but it has a delay a large delay in depolarization that's what led to an arrhythmia so it should have easily just been like this a little bit down phase 2 phase 3 phase 4 and up but in early after depolarization what happened was this and what about delayed after repolarization this happened therefore these are both arrhythmias perfect so abnormal automaticity and abnormal impulse conduction two main reasons automaticity in other words is contraction so SA node depolarizes the fastest during phase 4 where sodium starts to move in SA node depolarizes which means it gets activated the fastest it leads to a pacemaker effect of the heart contracts the sodium and calcium ions are responsible for this step antiarrhythmics act to reduce the phase 4 depolarization by blocking the sodium and calcium ions so if we went back here how this had a early after depolarization the sodium channel blockers and calcium channel blockers will prevent that however abnormal impulse conduction is where impulse normally is conducted to the ventricle ventricles through bifurcation in the two directions down the pathway so atria ventricle it has a bifurcation through which the impulse travels that's normal very normal however when one of the pathways of the bifurcation is blocked known as unidirectional blockage then the impulse of the site re-enters the conduction so if for example in this case this side is completely blocked then the other active side tends to re-enter into the atria and that re-entry is what leads to arrhythmia this re-entry is the most common cause of arrhythmia re-entry leads to re-excitation of the ventricles prematurely premature contraction because after it goes up it will come down remember the picture at the beginning of the lecture today that's this it causes what is known as ventricular arrhythmia antiarrhythmic drugs slow down this conduction or increase the refractory period and that's how they treat either conduction or contraction here's a diagram to explain the same so here this is normal this is atria this is ventricle and there is a bifurcation 
So normally the nerve impulse travels down and bifurcates and goes to the ventricle wall, the ventricle tissue. Fair enough. However, there are times when there is unidirectional block, where impulse is blocked in one direction, which is here. It's not propagating. And that's why it would re-enter the system again, causing a double premature stimulation of the ventricle walls. So the impulse travels in retrograde direction, re-enters the conduction pathway, causing extra irregular heartbeat. That's, that's arrhythmias, down to the physiology. So here's another diagram. Refractory tissue, right here. Conduction delay is here. So normally, we have this. As easy as that. But when there is a conduction delay, there is a longer time it takes for the impulse to travel. And that leads to arrhythmias as well. Okay, so let's classify antiarrhythmic, or sorry, arrhythmias. Let's classify arrhythmias. And so far, we now know that there's atrial, there's ventricular, and there's supraventricular, right, at the AV node. So, atrial arrhythmias, we have atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, and atrial extrasystole. Whereas ventricular tachycardia, we have ventricular fibrillation, also known as VFib, acute ventricular tachycardia, and ventricular extrasystole. Ventricular fibrillation can also be attributed to no AED response. Automatic defibrillator. And supraventricular tachycardia is AV nodal re-entry, acute supraventricular tachycardia. These are the different types. Do you have to know all of these? Not really. It's easy to remember that uh, atrial fl flutter and atrial fibrillation occur above due to SA node, whereas ventricular fibrillation occurs uh, and AV nodal re-entry, all of that occurs due to AV nodes and ventricular tissues. That would be enough to remember. So, a little short note. Ventricular fibrillation, most common arrhythmia, okay? AFib, most common, with multiple ectopic foci of impulses in the atrial tissue. That's why it has 100 to 150 irregular beats per minute and a reduced cardiac output. Main goal is to reduce heart rate and reprogram the sinus rhythm in the SA node. That's all we need to do. Remember, AFib, SA node. AV node re-entry. That's the unidirectional block slide that we just talked about, where it leads to irregular ventricular and premature or sustained ventricular contractions. Main goal is to slow down the conduction so it prevents re-entry. This is in the AV node, so AV. Now, acute ventricular tachycardia is generally a cause of death with patients who have MI, myocardial infarction, and it's impaired in car cardiac output and tachycardia leads to ventricular fibrillation. So when it progresses, the acute ventricular tachycardia becomes a V-fib, and that's when people die. Main goal is to slow down the heart rate and jumpstart the heart, and that's why in movies and TV shows, they say, hey, V-fib, let's get a crash cart and give an AED and a pen of epi, a shot of epi, okay? Antiarrhythmic drugs and their functions slash malfunctions. Now, this is tricky, right? Drugs shouldn't have malfunctions. Well, arrhythmia can be, cannot be treated, actually. It can only be palliated. What, I, what do I mean by that is there's no cure for arrhythmias, essentially, at least by pharmacological means. So, let's talk about it. Modification of the impulse generation or conduction to treat arrhythmias symptomatically only. So we can do two things. We can modify the impulse generation or contraction, and we could try and conduct uh, the flow differently, but it can only relieve symptoms. It will not permanently cure the problem. These drugs can actually cause arrhythmias themselves, as well as digoxin. Right? That's one of the drugs that are antiarrhythmics. We'll take a look at them in the details
in the coming slides, but digoxin causes arrhythmias. The treatment for digoxin-induced arrhythmia is then through another drug known as phenytoin. Also, the potassium inhibition leads to prolongation of QT interval. So in the ECG readings that we talked about in the cardiovascular overview lecture, that potassium will end up prolonging the QT interval in the ECG reading to help treat the arrhythmias, but excessive QT prolongation causes an actual diagnosis known as torsad the points. That can occur. What it is, is ventricular tachyarrhythmias. TDPs are one of the hardest to deal with, and other drugs such as macrolides and antipsychotics can lead to QT prolongation as well, and that can be life-threatening if used together. Alternatives to drugs. So because pharmacology with antiarrhythmics cause so much trouble, what can we do? Well, we can do implantable cardioverter defibrillator, which is shocking the heart in arrhythmias to kind of restart the heart every time there's an arrhythmia, or a pacemaker, which maintains the heart's regularity and heartbeat running. Okay, so this here is a ICD, implantable cardioverter defibrillator. It looks like a, a device that is a pulse generator, an electric current generator is placed here inside our body, and it allows the heart to receive electric currents through different LEDs. Okay, and then of course the propagation of the impulses become a lot more synchronous. So here are the drug groups of antiarrhythmic classification. So we have class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, and other drugs. But the good thing is, so far, we've already talked about this. Sodium channel blockers, potassium channel blockers, calcium channel blockers. These are very, very easy. The only other class left is beta blockers. Other antiarrhythmic drugs, adenosine, digoxin, magnesium sulfate. We'll talk about this in detail later on. So think of it this way. Class 1 is sodium channel blockers. Class 2 is beta blockers. Class 3 is potassium channel blockers. And class 4 is calcium channel blockers. NABKCA. Fair enough? Awesome. Class 1 sodium channel blockers are divided into three subtypes, A, B, and C. So you'll notice here 1A, 1B, 1C. Each act on different phases in the cardiac muscle potential phase 0 or phase 3. Class 1C is no longer used, so we're not going to talk about those drugs. They've had several side effects, so they stopped using it here in Canada at least. Class 1A acts on phase 0, that is depolarization, remember? It will slow down the depolarization. Phase 3 is ventricular repolarization, and it's shortened to help with the arrhythmia. And class 1C is no longer used. So class 1, class 2, class 3, class 4, class other class. So class 4 is diltiazem verapamil. We talked about this in antihypertensive lectures. Class 3, potassium channel blockers, amiterone, one of the most famously used, and sotalol. Class 2 is beta blockers. And they have ethinolol, esmolol, metaprolol. Remember the olols. Very easily understood and remembered. And comes class 1. Class 1A has procainamide as one of the most commonly used drugs. And we have class 1B, which is lidocaine, the other most commonly used drug. Okay, here's a, here's a little summary. Classification of drug 1A. Sodium channel blocker, we know that slows phase 0 depolarization in ventricular muscles. So it prevents that propagation of a fast impulse. 1B, again a sodium channel blocker, shortens phase 3 repolarization in ventricular muscles. So it helps prevent the delay in arrhythmias. 1C is no longer used. Class 2, 
is beta blockers. They inhibit phase 4 depolarization in the SA and the AV node. And that phase 4 is when sodium starts to move in and create a impulse. Class 3, potassium channel blockers. They prolong phase 3 repolarization in the muscle fibers. So 1B shortens phase 3. Class 3 prolongs phase 3. And lastly, class 4 is calcium channel blockers. They inhibit action potential from actually just being generated as is. That's from our references, guys. Okay, so let's take a deeper look at all of them. Okay, so the class 1 sodium channel blockers such as quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide. What's the mechanism of action? Well, they bind to open and inactivate sodium channels and they prevent sodium influx into the cell. That slows down the phase 0 depolarization going from negative to positive. It slows that process down. It decreases that slope of phase 4 depolarization later as well. Right, so this goes up, comes down, plateau, repolarization, and depolarization. So it affects phase 0 and phase 4. That's what class 1A affects. Therefore, it has potassium channel blocker effects as well during class 3. So the class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs are potassium channel blockers. This sodium channel blocker covers the first and the last phase. Therefore, inevitably, it has class 3 effects as well. It slows the conduction velocity, increases refractory phase, and has a mild alpha adrenergic blocking action, specifically quinidine. Therapeutic uses, it's used for atrial, AV, ventricular arrhythmias, such as quinidine and procainamide specifically, and ventricular arrhythmias by diazopyramide. Right, so it affects the entire impulse propagation itself. Pharmacokinetics, hepatic, CYP453, A4 metabolism with active metabolites, so drug interactions are possible with these drugs. Adverse effects can be symptomatic, such as blurred vision, tinnitus, and psychosis. It's, it's called synchronism. Quinidine inhibits CYP2D6, again, drug interactions. It inhibits it, so any drugs metabolized by CYP2D6 will not get metabolized and it will stay in the body longer. Hypotension, procainamide. It, procainamide can lead to hypertension, xerostomia, urine retention, constipation, blurred vision, all the anticholinergic properties as a part of diazopyramide as well. So that's class 1A. Moving on to class 1B. Remember, lidocaine was the most popular from this drug. Lidocaine, yes, the local anesthetic. It's, again, a sodium channel blocker, right? Local anesthetics are sodium channel blockers. The mechanism of action is that rapid association and disassociation of sodium channels occurs. That is for phase 3, repolarization being shortened. So think of it this way. This is phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, and phase 4, right? So this is phase 3. This happens because all the sodium is blocked, zero. All the channels are closed. Therefore, all the charge goes down to negative. But with lidocaine, they have rapid association and disassociation. So it will open, close, open, close, open, close sodium channels, leading to a shorter phase 3 depolarization where it comes down from phase 2 to phase 3, and all of a sudden it will go to phase 4. So in the case that there is an excessive repolarization of phase 3, this drug can be used to shorten that. It also decreases action potential. Therapeutic uses, the use with rapid depolarization of cardiac cells. Ventricular fibrillation, pulseless ventricular tachycardia, that's when lidocaine can be used. Lidocaine used in combination with amiterone, which is again class 3. So we can see how important class 3 has been when it needs to be used in combination with class 1. 
Little effect on conduction by atria or AV has nothing to do with conduction. It will only associate itself with sodium, which has to do with contraction. So, pharmacokinetics, excessive first pass metabolism. Therefore, Lido is given IV only. So, orally, if you give it, lots of metabolism and Lido will never get to us. Therefore, IV only. Metabolized by CYP1A2, CYP3A4 in the liver with active metabolites. Adverse effects are nystagmus, drowsiness, convulsion, nausea, vomiting, dyspepsia, and that's all through lidocaine. Moving on to class 2, beta blockers. Olols, metoprolol, propranolol, esmolol. The mechanism is very simple. They diminish phase 4 depolarization. So this phase right here, this phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, and phase 4. This does not exist. Phase 4 cancelled with beta blockers. They slow down the automaticity, they prolong the AV conduction, decrease the heart rate and contractility. Therapeutic uses tachyarrhythmias. When there is extremely high irregular heartbeat, that's when beta blockers can be used to reduce the heart activity. Atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, AV node re-entry. Symptomatic tachycardia, prevention of life-threatening ventricular arrhythmia with MI patients. So look how important beta blocker has gotten. Pharmacokinetics, CYP2D6 metabolism, and CNS penetration. This is by metoprolol. But esmolol is the shortest acting, fastest onset, short half-life, and metabolized by esterases in the plasma. So lidocaine has liver only, whereas beta blockers has liver and plasma as its metabolism. Adverse effects, excessive adrenergic activity. Specifically, which adrenergic activity? Antagonistic. Excessive antagonistic activity, such as hypotension, excessive blocking of the heart and vessels. Okay, class three, the big class here, and the high, the one highlighted in the white, amiterone, is the only one that we'll speak of in detail because it's important one only. So it diminishes efflux of potassium ions during repolarization. So over here we have phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. In this case, it says it diminishes efflux of potassium. Efflux of potassium is during repolarization phase, which is this phase. It diminishes that. That's where it acts as class three, right in the middle of the propagation. So it prolongs the action potential, of course, of depolarization and resting potential, thereby increases refractory. Therefore, it will now take all the way up, come down, plateau, and for it to get to repolarization, it will take longer and then class four occurs. So this phase right here is prolonged. Amiterone is like thyroxine with iodine. Amiterone. So it's basically a thyroxine iodine combination like drug. It acts like class one, two, three, four with an alpha adrenergic blocking effect, all of it together because it breaks down the action potential and prolongs it all the way. So it slows everything down. Therapeutic uses treatment of severe refractory supraventricular ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Severe being the keyword. Treatment of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter. So both atrial are used here. Pharmacokinetics, prolonged half-life for weeks, distribution in adipose tissue extensively, loading doses preferred, metabolized by CYP3A4. Adverse effects, it can induce arrhythmia itself. Look how long it takes for it to come back to shape. Pulmonary fibrosis, neuropathy, hepatotoxicity, blue-gray skin, thyroid disorders, remember it's thyroxine and iodine, so thyroid disorders, and CYP1A2, 2C9, 2D6 inhibition, so extreme drug interactions right here. Therefore, class 3 may be highly effective 
but it's really not the best to be used. Then come class 4, calcium channel blockers, verapamil, glutathione. Mechanism of action is that verapamil has greater action on the heart muscle and binds to open depolarized calcium channels. It decreases influx of calcium. So remember from our previous lecture that yes, verapamil acts as a dilator of the vessels. That's perfect. However, when it has a greater effect on the heart, it will prevent the conduction of SA node itself. Okay, so when it works on the heart, it works directly on the contraction ability of the heart. So it prevents that. And it prevents repolarization resulting in decreased rate of phase 4 depolarization. So we got calcium activity. It prevents it. Phase 4 sodium propagation prevented. And therefore, AV and SA node both conduction is slowed. Perfect. So contraction and conduction, both blocked. So very effective in treating arrhythmias. Treatment of re-entry supraventricular tachycardia or tachyrhythmia reduces ventricular rate in atrial flutter and atrial fibrillation. So all over arrhythmias. Same as the other, metabolized by CYP3A4. Adverse effects, it can also inhibit CYP3A4, leading to drug-drug interaction. So here's a huge diagram that explains all the classes important to us. This is class 1A, class 1B, class 3, and class 4. And again, class 2 was just beta blockers. Okay, so class 1A, it says that drugs slow down phase 0 depolarization. In addition, because of their class 3 activity, these drugs prolong the action potential itself. So think of it this way, that class 1A, which is sodium channel blockers, affects the phase 0 normally, and this section here, phase 3, is prolonged. It's known as effective refractory period, and that period is prolonged. So. Quinidine, procainamide, and disopyramide block open or inactivated sodium channels. These drugs have an intermediate or slow rate of association with sodium channels. So this phase here is what is prolonged, the red one. And of course, if there is no drug involved, then there is a full-fledged depolarization, then phase 1. However, in the case of class 1A sodium channel blockers, there is a delayed response in that and of course a prolonged effect of repolarization after that. Okay, class 1B shortens phase 3. Notice how phase 3 has become shorter. It decreases the duration of action potential, so it shortens it. Effective refractory period is shortened. Lidocaine blocks the Open or inactivated sodium channels. These drugs have a rapid rate of association with sodium channels. So because it will plus minus the sodium channels, it will bring it in, pull it out, bring it in, pull it out. That's when effective refractory period is shortened. Phase 3 is shortened. And then comes class 3. Phase 3 repolarization, which is extensively delayed. It prolongs the phase 3 repolarization without altering phase 0. So notice how phase 0 is as normal as it gets. Phase 1 comes down, phase 2 is plateau, and phase 3, look at how extensive it is. This gray picture back here, gray section, is normal, but phase 3 is prolonged. With amiodarone and sotalol, they block potassium channels. So potassium has to stay inside. Potassium cannot leave. Fair enough? It cannot leave outside of the cell. Okay. Class 4 drugs slow down. This is calcium channel blockers, guys. They slow down phase 4, spontaneous depolarization, and slows the conduction in tissues that depend on calcium currents, such as AV node in the heart. What does that mean? Well, drugs like verapamil and deltaism, they block calcium channels. Therefore, no calcium can move inside the cell. And because of that, 
the depolarization stage here has become slow. Otherwise, it would have been really, really fast, right? It's now slow, the phase four. Perfect. So all of these are the pictorial diagrams or representation of where, which drug acts on the slopes of cardiac impulse propagation. Then comes digoxin. Okay, these are the other drugs. Digoxin is a sodium potassium ATPase pump inhibitor. Wow, what does that mean? Well, the mechanism of action is that it inhibits sodium and potassium pump. Very simple. It shortens the refractory period in atria and ventricular cell. So by refractory period, we mean that it goes up, phase 0, phase 1, phase 2, phase 3, phase 4. Digoxin will shorten that period. And that is by like this, moving up, comes down, and all of a sudden it has become this much shorter. That's the job of digoxin. It shortens the refractory period, lengthens the refractory period of AV node. It does the same thing when it comes to the AV node, but this time it will affect the length of the propagation and make it even longer. So look how different digoxin acts, right? It diminishes the conduction velocity. And no matter what happens, it's capable of increasing the contraction. Okay, so let's keep that in mind. That contraction is always going to be high. So it will lead to contraction. But when it comes to conduction right here, it diminishes that velocity. It slows down the conduction. So it competes with sympathetic response when digoxin inhibits conduction. In other words, when our brain says that, hey, why, why is the conduction so slow? Let me bring it up faster. That's when digoxin competes with the sympathetic autonomous nervous system. And of course, we will talk about this in the future lectures when we talk about congestive heart failures. There's an entire short note on it, but this is just a brief idea. When should we use digoxin? Treatment of ventricular response rate in atrial fibrillation flutter. Can we use in the treatment of heart failure? Like I said, we will talk about this in detail in heart failure, congestive heart failure. But lower concentrations are very important. And adverse effects that CYP3A4 inhibition takes place. Again, our lecture with drug interaction is extremely detailed. So please do view it for more drug interactions as this lecture mentioned a lot of drug interactions. It can cause arrhythmia as well as it being treated with phenytoin and magnesium sulfate. So a arrhythmia induced by digoxin can be treated by phenytoin and magnesium sulfate. A short note on digoxin will be presented in a CVS lecture of congestive heart failure. Other two drugs, adenosine and magnesium sulfate. Adenosine is a naturally occurring nucleoside, decreases conduction velocity, and prolongs the refractory period at high doses. So it slows down the propagation. It also decreases automaticity in AV nodes. So contraction, decrease. Conduction, decrease. Therefore, it's the drug of choice for treating supraventricular tachycardia or tachyrhythmia. Low toxicity leads to chest pain, hypotension, and flushing as side effects, and it's extremely short direction. So adenosine can be used to treat arrhythmia. Magnesium sulfate. It is necessary for sodium, calcium, potassium transport across the membrane. It's a taxi. Therefore, it slows the rate of SA node impulse and prolongs conduction time very well. It will just keep running these ions in, in its taxi and therefore the prolongation of conduction takes place. It's a drug of choice for treating fatal arrhythmias, for sad points, and digoxin-induced arrhythmia. So very, very important to remember this last point is going to be an important point in the lecture. That was our lecture for today for antiarrhythmics. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And for any other cardiovascular questions, please visit our previous lectures. The links are in the description box below. The re references today used were Lippincott for pharmacology and Geaton and Hall for physiology section of the 
lecture. Thank you for watching. Have a great day and stay tuned to Tooth Factory for an amazing lecture like this one. We'll see you in the next lecture of congestive heart failure. Thank you. Have a good day.